You're listening to the Mind Over Murder podcast. My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook group, together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. We're joined again by Ted Bundy expert and author Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, thanks for joining us again. Thanks. The first one was fun, and I'll, this one will be great, too. I think so, too. My first question for you today really has to do with, I'm going to call it the cult of personality that surrounds Ted Bundy. The first time that I was at CrimeCon, I remember very vividly passing a woman in the hotel lobby who had a screen printed dress with mugshots of serial killers and a Ted Bundy tattoo on her arm. Why are there women, do you think, that are attracted to or tend to gravitate toward Ted Bundy, considering that he is a killer of women? That is an excellent question. That is something that has stymied people for many years. If you notice in the trial of Ted Bundy, the trials in Florida, he had his groupies, the local news broadcasts, interviewed several of these girls. And I remember the one girl said, I just don't think he could be capable of those things. So what are they really doing? They're seeing somebody that's handsome. They're seeing somebody that's on trial. He's, he speaks well. He's got a good intellect. And they are drawn to him. Now, in the one case, the woman just didn't feel like he had committed those murders. But there are other people, there are other women that I've talked to personally who do believe Bundy committed those murders, but they would love for Bundy to be alive now. And they'd like to be his girlfriend. And I said, you do. I have said this on several occasions. I said, you do fit the pattern. He would like to sever. He would like to kill you and sever your head and take it home. That's who you're dealing with. And they, it's odd. I don't know. I don't have a background in psychology or I'm not an expert in in, in those things, but I will say it's a strange thing. And I don't know why they're attracted to somebody so heinous. I cannot imagine. I can't imagine someone marrying Richard Ramirez after he had committed all those diabolical murders, but he found a wife and she wanted to marry him. What can we say about these people? I don't know. They're very strange. And they somehow are able to compartmentalize, which something Bundy was very good at, and put Bundy's heinous things that he did with his victims in one category. And if they could just be the girlfriend, then he would be good to them and never murder them and just have sex with them. But then again, why would you want to have sex with somebody who cuts off women's heads. I don't know. I have found that it's like there are these little planets they are spinning off on their own and they're just not like you and me. So I don't know what to make of them, but they're very, I made a comment once on my Facebook page and I got 750 comments. I remember uh, and that. A lot actually. of these women remember Kevin, what they did were, you say? What did you tear say? My head off. What did you say that set people off so much? Well, I said it could, I, it, I think of the one case, I've talked about it several times. I said, look, it could be a mental illness. It's something's wrong. It's just not normal. It's not normal to want to be at that crime thing in Duquesne that I spoke at. I said, I could see the most beautiful woman in the world. But if I learned that she liked to cut men's heads off, I thought that would put a damper on it. Yeah. I would say, no, no, she, no, I don't know. She's not so good looking to me anymore. I don't understand what's wrong with these women. They come from different backgrounds, but the common fact, the common, the thing that draws them all together is their attraction towards Ted Bundy. How can one be attracted to someone so diabolical? So it's beyond me. I just leave that to the experts. I've even learned now just to go past them and not even comment. I thought I'll help them a little bit and talk about him severing heads, but that didn't do it. That didn't put a dent in any of these women. In fact, I had a woman call, not call me, but start messaging me about a year ago. And she is supposed to marry soon. And her son doesn't want her to, but a serial killer 
out in Washington State. Oh, the mm. guy. Oh, Bur- I know Burl Bear wrote a book about this guy, but I can't remember his name. It's probably and she just told as me, well that we leave the name out of it because who yeah, wants to give this yeah. guy any publicity? Kristen and yeah, I, yeah, true. Kristen but, and I have talked about this on the podcast before. Awful. We are completely baffled by this. Yeah, me too. We don't see mm. what is sexy about someone who goes out and deliberately hurts and kills women. I'm completely at a loss. Yeah, I, I, I don't I know how they could not. I remember on this particular thread that you were talking about, Kevin, because that was one of the only times that I have ever actually sat and scrolled through comments just for Uh fun. I tend to not, but it was was something in the 700s. But I remember there being some women on Uh there who were very vehemently saying, but he wouldn't hurt me. He would love me. He would love me. Everybody else, he would kill other people, but not me. I would reform him. I would make him better. And that alone was really unbelievable. It's beyond delusional. And it's delusional. You'd be gambling with your life, literally, because yes, Kevin, as you said in our last episode, there were women that Ted Bundy was interested in dating and he might not have harmed those women. And then there were other right. women that were more in the prey category for him. Yes. Are there differences between the type that he would date and the type that he would kill from your perspective? That's an excellent question. I really don't think there is. He told Bill Hagmeyer, he said, I like to prey on women who were brought up much from middle-class backgrounds who were taught by their parents to be of help to people if they need it. And he said, I would use these things against them. The thing that is different about Bundy than about the Green River Killer a decade later, the Green River Killer was killing women who unfortunately knew they were putting themselves out in harm's way that they could run into somebody bad and something bad could happen but with bundy his victims were just going about the regular routine of their lives if you look at who if you look at the people that bundy killed they could be like linda ann healy she was getting ready to graduate college and if you look at brenda ball she had given college a try, but she just, but she's a nice lady and she, she's got some education, but not as much. So it wasn't anything to do with that. We'll say this. He didn't want to kill any other type of woman than a white woman, because I know Mike Fisher told me a story where there was a woman of Native American heritage who tried to get Bundy's attention at a location where he was hunting for a woman. She told Fisher I made it real clear through eye contact that I was interested and Bundy was not interested in her. It's pretty clear to me that if she'd have been Fisher thinks it's just because she wasn't white. And I think that's probably right. So he had a certain victim that he wanted to murder would be Caucasian women or young girls. So I can't think of anything out there that would say why her or why not her. He did say this. He said there were times when he said, I would go with a woman. It was my intention to take her and abduct her. But instead of doing it for some reason, he said, I don't know why. For some reason, I'd get to my car and I'd say, thank you very much. And and I would let her go. He said it happened one night, just a couple weeks, a week or two before he kidnapped George Ann Hawkins from Greek Row at the University of Washington and walked her a block down to a deserted parking lot and assaulted her and knocked her out and got her in the car. He said he did the same thing two weeks later with Hawkins, but this time he did want to kill her. Then he thought, oh my God, I told the woman it was the same deal. I was hobbling on crutches, said I lived in the area. They were small talk. I took her to my car, and then I whacked her on the head. He said, but with this other girl, all this small talk, and then I let her go. If she hears about this, she could say, this is what Bundy was saying. She could say, there was this weird guy, that, and he hears what he looks like, and he drove a, a beige Volkswagen, and he took me all the way to his car, and then thanked me after I helped him. He said, I can't believe I did that. But because it it may come back on me. So there were times rare. There were times when he would let certain people go. And then one time when he was talking to Stephen Michaud, of course, all that 
was in the third person with Michelle. By the way, it was in the third person when he also talked to Ron Holmes. And then end of life confessions, he came out and said, I did this, I did that. He had said to Michelle was during one of his, quote, <clears throat> the Reformation periods, unquote. And then Bundy laughed. He said he had picked up a hitchhiker. They went out and they went somewhere and they drank. And he said, we had sex. He said, I was trying to see if I could go the, like the night with her and not murder her. He could tell that desire to kill her was rising. Wow. But he said, I wanted to be able to prove to myself that I could let her go. He did let her go. Like a test. So he dropped her off somewhere. Yeah, j just like a test. He wasn't sure why he let this other girl go. That was like a couple weeks before the Hawkins murder in the same area. He just said, I just decided to not do it for some reason. He didn't even name a reason. But later he thought that, that may come back to harm me because of the similarities. And now they're out looking for Georgia and Hawkins. If she comes forward, that could mean somebody. Now, that could mean something. So he had his own reasons. Here's another thing. When you talk about bodies, body dumps, Bundy said those that I buried have never been found. And if you look at those that he buried that haven't been found, he never said how far off trails or anything that he buried them. He just said they've never been found. But one thing we do know, sometimes when Bundy would kill a victim, it's almost like he wanted them to be found. For there were certain victims pulled off not too far from pathways where they could be seen. It was the case of Laura and Amy. It was that case in Melissa Smith. She was found very close to a neighborhood, kind of like budding up to it. So I think in those cases, he wanted them found. And what's really interesting in the dump, the body dump in Taylor Mountain, that only contained the skulls of four of the women. They always wondered where the rest of the bodies were. I think the rest of the bodies are also on Taylor Mountain, but he there's something peculiar. If he buried the bodies on Taylor Mountain, the reason why I said I think he did because they found some additional bones were likely uprooted by predators. Mm -hmm. When the body was decaying, they might pull up a leg bone here or something else or a hand bones or whatever, but not very much was found. I think the rest of the remains were on Taylor Mountain. Now, here's the funny thing. Again, funny as in odd. When he dumped the skulls, the heads off, and then they rotted, he only went about a thousand feet back off of the power line road and they were ultimately discovered now here's the thing if he buried the bodies it's probably likely bundy took great pleasure in the fact that he thought i'll dump these heads and they'll be discovered one day and it'll set the city ablaze now he never said but it only takes a few minutes to dig 15 minutes to dig a hole that you can put four heads in and cover them back up it doesn't take long at all and he could have chosen to do that my feeling, and this has been the suspicions of detectives, is that sometimes Bundy wanted these victims found. And again, like in the case of Karen Campbell, he abducted her from the Wildwood Inn and drove 2.8 miles down a road leading out of the Wildwood Inn and dumped her off on a snowbank. Yeah, just left her. Of course, she had some part of her face was gone later because of the wolves or coyotes or something that came up and chewed a lot of the arm off. But he wanted, I just believe it was a type of boast. And there were times when he wanted the bodies found because of what it would do to people. He was a great, when I say great, he was a voracious follower of his crimes in the newspapers. So he kept up with what everything that they were saying about this unknown killer and what they found and what they didn't find. So very, very odd of him. But he had a lot of quirks like that. Of course, mass media of the day were newspapers. Yeah. Most of the reporting would be there. Yes, and he read them all because he could get his hands on. You um, said something very interesting yeah. a moment ago, Kevin. You said that when he was in these interviews, he'd be speaking about the murderer in the third person. So he'd be saying, yes, he did this. He did that. As opposed to, yeah. I did this. I did that. Yes. What did the yes, detectives he, think was going on? He only did that with, for example, when he was on Bundy had contacted somebody after he was arrested in Florida for these murders. He knew he wasn't going to go anywhere. He was going to have to stand trial. He always said he was innocent. He never would admit guilt until the very end. So when he decided to hire Stephen Michaud and Hugh Ainsworth 
to do investigation on the case to prove his innocence. At the time, Michelle was working, I think he was working for Business Week magazine. His agent called and said, there's this serial killer named Ted Bundy down in Florida. He wants to, he's trying to get a hold of you. And when Steve Michelle and Hugh Ainsworth decided to do this project with Bundy because they knew that every all these murders from the Pacific Northwest to Utah to Colorado down now to Florida were likely Bundy. They knew it was going to be a big case, but they were going to try to look for evidence just like Bundy wished to see if they could prove he wasn't the person. They came to the opposite conclusion that he was. But early on, they hit a stone wall with and that is Michaud did because Bundy could not elaborate on these various murders. So Michaud said to him one day, he said, listen, why why don't you do this? A lot about serial murder, and you're not going to be admitting anything to anyone. Why don't you speak about it in the third person and give us your opinion of what you think people in these situations would do, like the person that kidnapped Kathy Parks or the person that did this or did that. In fact, when Michaud was talking to him about Kathy Parks, he said, would this person have needed a gun? He, He said, no, that person would not need a gun. Oh my God. So he was able to tell a lot about what happened, but without saying I did this or I did that, which was very fortunate for him. He did the same thing with Ron Holmes. He spoke in the third person. And when uh, I should say that Bill Hagmeyer worked with him from 1986, I don't know the month, but 1986 through his execution early in 1989, which he was executed on in January 1989, he said to Bill one day, he said, do you expect me to say I did this or that? He said, no, I don't expect you to say that at all. I just expect you to tell me your opinion of what you think about all of these things. He said, that I can do. But the more he got to know Bill and the more he liked Bill, and Bill told me one day, he said, He considered me his friend, his best friend. He said after Bundy was executed, he said after he was executed, Louise Bundy, his mother, Mm -hmm. and Johnny Bundy, whenever they were on the East Coast, they would come out to see Bill Eggmeyer. I used to get, he said, I used to get Christmas cards from Louise every year. You're kidding. But I said, no, every year, because Ted had told them, his parents, I like Bill so much. He's my friend. And Eggmeyer told me, he said, and Hagmeyer is a nice guy. He really is a nice fellow. And he said, I had buddies here in the FBI who were saying, why are you getting so close to him? That's weird. I said, wait a minute, Bill. Are you telling me you had to explain to them your motives <laughs> for really? becoming friendly with Ted Bundy? Of course, <laughs> it's to become his friend so you can get the information. And they yeah. couldn't see that. He said, no, they couldn't see it. Wow. But it was just funny. But anyway... But once he got to know Bill, towards the end, when he knew he had to start coming clean, he said to Hagmeyer, I want to just confess to you. Oh, this is something I should tell you. Ron Holmes had corresponded with Bundy and for six months and then went down and interviewed him face to face. And they were supposed to do a follow-up film interview. What Bob Keppel told me one day, he said, until they had a falling out, Holmes was going to be Bundy's golden boy. That is, he was going to be the one he confessed all the murders to, but they had a falling out. So when it came to confess, really confess and say, I committed these murders and then go into detail about them. He asked Bill if he could confess just to him because he felt comfortable doing that. Bill said, no, he said, I'll be in in every session, but I can't. You can't just do it with me. You got to talk to the detectives from these states who have missing and murdered women that you're confessing to. So he sat in every one. And it was during that period that he said, I did this and I did that. And then if he hit on something that he didn't want to speak about because he was a necrophile and yet he never wanted to really talk about it, he would admit to it. He didn't really want to talk about it. He also didn't want to talk about the murder of teenage or preteen girls. But I've always suspected he killed more than he admitted to. Now we know he killed Lynette Culver, what was 12, who was 12, Pocatello, Idaho. He said, I thought she was older, in his view, 14, 15, but as if that would make a great deal of difference. Really? Difference but he also, make. yeah, difference. 
And he also, his last victim was Kim Leach, 12 years old in Florida. But I've always suspected, yeah, that he, yeah, she was 12. And I always suspected that he killed more and maybe even younger. I've got missing kids. There's one girl, 10, missing from Washington State. There were some things about it that made me think this could very well have been Bundy. Here's what Bundy admitted to in the third person during one of these talks he was having. I don't know if it was Michelle or somebody else. But he said, this killer that we're talking about killed up to a half a dozen young girls. Oh, Oh, wow. So that's uh, that's an admission of sorts, isn't it? Oh, it is an admission. He is admitting it. And it's exactly, even before I heard that, I thought there has to be more. And when he was caught in Florida, he had a cheerleader magazine. I don't know, these girls, 13, 14 years old. I guess he figured that was a turn on to look at it. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. But when it came to the end, he would confess really just about everything. And if there was things he didn't want to talk about, like the necrophilia, he would just blow past it. He did admit to the Idaho investigators. He didn't do it at the time. It came out later. In fact, my book is, I should say my first book, The Bundy Murders, talked about, I was able to find out information that in the confession, in the Idaho confession, he said that he drowned the girl. He was, they only had one hour to speak and they had two cases to go over. It was the Idaho hitchhiker and Lynette Culver, and they were going back and forth. When he talked about cranial damage, with the Idaho hitchhiker, if they ever found her, which they did, she was dumped in a river. He said there there would be cranial damage. He said, would there be cranial damage with the Culver girl? He said, no drowning. Then he said, and he put her in a river five miles north of Pocatello after he murdered her, which is the Snake River. And he just didn't know the name. But as they were leaving the prison, and so the official record in the movie, it says he admitted that he drowned her in the hotel room, Culver. That's not true. <laughs> he didn't admit that. After everybody was dismissed, Diana Weiner cut it off at his civil attorney at exactly one hour. Bundy went back to his cell. Bill Hagmar left. Russ Renault and Randy Everett left. But as Randy Everett and Russ Renault were going out to the parking lot, it's so funny. Renault told me that the press, they had those big instruments so they could listen in on people whispering like where he was. He said, look, you, I'm going to have to really whisper this. He said he whispered to Randy Everett. He said, Bundy admitted drowning Culver, but he didn't say how he did it. Could you go back in and find out? And I said, and he said, yes, I will. And so I said to Russ, I said, Randy had his own second meeting with that. And he said, yes, here's what they did. Bundy was really being honest and forthright. He said, listen, to those two investigators right before it was dismissed, he said, I know an hour isn't much time. He said, if you have any additional questions, please come back. I'll see what I can do to answer them. So here's what he did. He sent Randy back in to clarify on the drowning hell that occurred. They let him back in the prison. They took him to a room. About 20 minutes later, Bundy came in. Bundy sat down and they began to talk. He said, listen, Ted, he said, you've never. And I spoke to Randy himself. He told me this over the phone. He said, I went back and I sat down. We talked. I said, I asked him how he drowned Culver. He said, oh, yeah, I know where she was already dead when I put her in the river. He said, I drowned her in the bathtub. That had never come out. That was just between him and Randy. And, and then he said, then I put her in the trunk of the VW, which was on the front. And I've been to the Holiday Inn where he did this. It was fairly private. But if he just looked both ways and nobody was out there, he could slip her right in there and then go wait he dumped her in that river so he said he's saying he he put a woman's body in the trunk of a volkswagen yes i'm not actually in fact having spent a lot of time having fun with friends volkswagens yeah i'm not sure you could fit a woman's body in the front of a volkswagen the trunk is in the front and And i guess he had no trouble yeah he folded folded the the body up a bit probably folded her a little yeah little bit she's 12 she's not all that big but right so it's not like somebody maybe six or seven feet tall but yeah, yeah. he was able to get her in there but yeah. here's the thing and then listen what bundy said ever said i didn't even have to ask him after he said that he drowned her in the bathtub he said oh i had sex with her body afterwards 
He just so he freely admitted that. the necrophilia. Yeah. yeah, he oh freely did it on his own. Everett trying to find out a human aspect of Bundy, he said, "Why did you do this? Just why?" Yeah. And Bundy said, "It was just the madness." He said, "That's all I can say. It's just the madness." Mm. And, yet, and you said so in, anyway in other situations so, he would not a, confess to necrophilia he just was real weird about it but for some reason he just gave it up to everett and R- randy had said he just said I, yeah i had sex with her after after she was dead but he loved that necrophilia for bundy here's the thing here's what hagmeyer told me also there's a little story behind that because when i contacted hagmeyer about this he and Hagmar wasn't in the second meeting. I said, Bill, I said, I'm getting ready to do this section on Lynette Culver and I'm waiting on the case file. But I said, the only thing that I know about her is her name, Lynette Culver, and that Bundy drowned her in the bathtub. And here's what Bill Hagmar said to me. He said, Kevin, he said, I've never heard that. He said, you do understand that Bundy's main MO was strangling the women from behind while he had sex with them. And that was his main MO. I said, I'm fully aware of that yes Mm -hmm. yeah he said i have great respect for the detective that told you that which was mike fisher he said if that's true that they had a second meeting like that he said i should have been there he said so i said look at the time bill's telling me this i said maybe this story is all messed up and maybe mike got some wrong information so i said bill i'll go back and check and i'll let if he said to me if you could find anything else about it let me know i said i will so I hung up. I called Fisher. Fisher's the one that first put me on to this. He said, yeah, you need to get hold of Russ Renault. And so I was able to get hold of Renault. He said, he'll tell you all about it because Russ told me about it down while we were all there. So I got Renault on the phone. He said, oh, yeah. He said, here's why Bill doesn't know it, because it happened afterwards. Then he explained what Randy did. So I had to go back and t- I sent Bill an email. And I said, yeah, it's true. Here's why. So I ended up publishing that email that I sent to Bill Higmeyer. In my second book, The Trail of Ted Bundy. But that's just another case of finding out something that I never thought I would find out. Now, the movie said he said it in the final confession, but that's not true. It came out later. It was just an oddity, weird thing. I and mean, here, Bill Hagmar is the expert. I was the novice. I was just the one gathering the information. Honestly, thought maybe I got some bad information, but it turned out to be true. So I want to make sure for the benefit of our listeners that they're aware of the movie we keep referencing. The movie is called No Man of God. It is probably the most recent entry in what seems like a massive litany of Bundy movies that have come out over the last couple of years. Because it feels, I told a friend we were doing this podcast interview today and he said, Bundy's really enjoying kind of a renaissance, isn't he? And I said, I don't think Bundy's ever actually left. But the movie that we're referencing is No Man of God, which features Elijah Wood as Bill Hagmeyer and a, an actor whose name I can't recall at the moment, who, as you said earlier, Kevin, has managed to get Bundy's mannerisms down to a terrifying degree. Yes. It's the, I've never seen anybody play Bundy that you can just look at this guy and you think you're talking to Bundy. In fact, I talked recently to somebody who knows Stephen Michelle very well. Michelle sat down and watched it. He said, my God, I thought I was back with Bundy just watching it. And what's really cool about that movie is everything, Bill worked so closely with the people that were producing the movie that everything you hear Bundy talk about came from Bill Hagmeyer. And it says it in the beginning of the movie. It's either from conversations with Bill, the transcripts, the tapes, whatever. There were things I heard in that movie that Bill told me, too. But just it's the most accurate movie. It, you're not going to see trails of murders and that going on. It's all dealing with the murderer, Ted Bundy. I don't know how they could have improved upon it. A really great movie. Do you feel, I asked you this once. I think I asked it on your page or else I sent it to you in a private message. Do you feel like all of these recent Bundy films encourage people to glorify him? Or do you feel like the films are like, this is how we learn about Ted Bundy? That's a good question. If any, I don't think most of these are done to glorify Bundy at all. I know that in media, they have a term, even media people among themselves, if it bleeds, it leads. You can't really talk about the Bundy case, honestly, without getting into a lot of shocking things. Now, I have said things in, I've been on a lot of documentaries, and I have said things, and I even said once, I said, I am not sure if you'll put this on the air. And then I said what I could say about a particular murder. Of course, it didn't show up on the air, so they have standards. 
I certainly don't feel no man of God. A movie like that is really showing Bundy at his worst. He was a terrible individual. It hides nothing. He was a very diabolical person. People connected to the, the case have been greatly affected by it. I don't see a lot of glorification there, but if somebody takes these movies and then gets the wrong idea, much like the women who are drawn to Bundy in the wrong way, I don't really see that as the fault of the movies or the fault of the documentaries. I do believe that it's important to get the information out. I know I've had a lot of these people that have called me and they said, Kevin, do you have new information? And I'd say, yes, I do. Can you share it? I said, no, I can't until publication. And we'd laugh about it. So they too are seeking new information. I think that keeps the story rolling. I do think that there's such an interest in it that it is 95% valid with most people. I think for some out there, they look at it wrong. They view it as wrong. But there are some people that don't believe you should ever talk about anything that is so heinous. But I don't see that. I think the more we know about what humans are capable of and the more we know about their patterns of murder and what they do and how they plan, I think the society is from the time of Bundy, you had a lot of female hitchhikers. Yes. You rarely see that anymore. You rarely see it because too many women have gotten murdered that way. Even when Bundy was committing murder, there were other killers out there killing women, lots of them. One, Warren Leslie Forrest, was killing women in southern Washington state. At the same time, others were in California murdering women. It's just all over. That has had an effect. People have become very knowledgeable of serial murder and how a lot of these people think. So they act accordingly. And there's a scene in the movie Sea of Love, and Al Pacino's playing a New York homicide detective, and he's with Ellen Barkin, and he said, there's the way you see the world, and there's the way we see the world, and we see it. There was a murder up there in that building. There was a murder in the alley over there. And these people are like, they're always picking up the pieces of this stuff. The more people realize what's out there and what could be, the safer off they'll be. All those kids that disappeared, those young girls near that train track, it's, you've seen some documentaries on them too. Do you know where all of that began to go wrong? I'm just going to say it because I've had people ask me to comment. You don't let minor children and girls out in areas that are so deserted like that. You just don't. It's not a good thing. I've studied murder and written about murder for the last 27 years. If you look at like little children, they get abducted at about almost the same level, maybe a little bit more girls. And then as they grow up, the boys reach a place where they become less chancy for b- becoming a, a statistic, but the girls continue. I just think that parents, although I'm affected by all the things I've heard about over the years, from people, a, a kid asking the mother for a ride to somebody's house, and she says, no, you should walk, and the kid walks, and is kidnapped and never seen again. Parents need to be careful where their minor children go. Of course, once the, the kid's male or female or 18, they should do what they want. But those kids were minor children. So that's where, and there, what? There's a predator there. So he's got a gun. He's going to be in control. That's where the real thing lies. You know what? The, I believe that picture they got off that phone, that could very well be him. Mm-hmm. Recording could very well be him. But boy, that case is gone. Kevin, before we wrap up, let's get you to run down the list of your books and where everybody can find them. Because we definitely want to provide you with more sales if possible. Okay, great. I've written 18 books. And rather than go through the entire litany, you can check my author page at Amazon. You'll see all the books if you click on the author page. I've written six books about Ted Bundy, beginning with the Bundy Murders of Comprehensive History. Those six volumes consist of 1,400 pages, but I'm going to be writing yearly updates now. And I've got a book coming out in 2022 with a lot of new information, testimonies. So you'll be able to get that. Now, if you want to come to Wild Blue Press, I've got a number of publishers, but I primarily write for Wild Blue Press now. If you go to wildbluepress.com and you go on the authors, you'll find me in a column and you'll not only see a bunch of my books, but I've got a lot of blogs on there that are archived. 
and I'll be putting a new one on there soon, and they can read these blocks. Some of these are connected with Amazon. You can even go on my author page, and you'll see links to them from there. So that's the best way to follow up on what I'm doing, either Amazon or at Wild Blue Press. Do you ever think you'll be done <laughs> with Ted Bundy? Feels like it's going to be an ongoing thing because new information is always becoming available. Here's the thing. I turned 67 in February. I'm a groundhog baby, so February 2nd. <laughs> and so I don't know how Poxitani Phil is, but I'll be 67. I don't know how long I'll write, but I, I know I'm going to write these yearly updates. And I got a tremendous amount of information for this one year. So will as much come in next year or will it be in two years I publish a volume two? As long as it's coming into me, I will put it out there because I want it saved for people to read about. If you can get it on the printed page, then the researchers can find it. So yes, I will keep doing that. I'm going to slow down on writing some of my other books because I, I still do a lot of other things and I'm giving myself a little bit of break on writing other books, but I will do those yearly updates or every two years, <laughs> depending <laughs> on how much comes in. I guess I'm going to write about Bundy until I, I fall over. Maybe. It depends <laughs> on how much information. And then, I just hope I don't fall over until I write the last line of the last volume. Okay. There you go. And what other topics do you are calling to you? What other things are you wanting to jump into? Now? You mean like in writing? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. There might be a couple avenues that I might do. I'm doing a lot of reading about World War II. And I might end up writing a book, I having to do something to do with that, I find a niche with, within that big cauldron of war that was World War II. And I might write something on that, but that'll be new for me because I've never written any, anything about it. And we want to reiterate, we love the idea of you coming to CrimeCon and Chris yes. and I will interview you in Great. a fireside chat format. Very friendly. Sure. I have a feeling they would be thrilled. Sure to have you come to Las Vegas this spring and meet your thousands of fans. You know what? We can do that. <laughs> we can do that. That might be fun. I think that would be great. <laughs> I'm moving to Texas. Listen, I live in Louisville. There you go. See, I'm just like a person that gets of a certain, we're moving to Texas. And I never thought we'd move, but we have family down there. So we want to be closer to the grandkids. And so they live just a little bit north of Austin. So that's where we're going. And uh, so Very we cool. look forward to it. We were visiting them down in Austin or I should say round rock over the Christmas, it was 80 degrees. I looked at my wife and I said, can you believe 80 degrees at Christmas? What are we doing up in Kentucky? I think we spent <laughs> enough time there. We need to come south. I think your new life in Texas sounds phenomenal. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. I'm looking forward to it. Thank you for joining well, us. We really appreciate, appreciate it. All right. It's good talking to you all. I appreciate the invitation and who knows, I guess we'll be in crime con together in Absolutely. Las Vegas at some point. So I look Absolutely. forward to it. All right. We'll see you all later. That's going to do it for this episode of mind over murder. Thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder. <laughs>